Hello everyone, I'm Klaus Aranha from the University of Tsukuba and this is Experiment Designs in Computer Science. This video is Topic 5 Multiple Comparisons and we are going to talk about comparisons among multiple samples. So let's get started. So there are many situations in which we are interested in comparing more than two samples at the same time to test if they belong to the same population or not. To give two examples, we may want to compare parameter tuning. So for an algorithm, we have several values for a, par for a parameter and we want to test these values. We can think, for instance, to test the configuration of a neural network and we want to test it with 10 layers and 20 layers and 30 layers, for example. So that would be three different uh, samples, three different points that we want to compare. Or uh, we may want to compare multiple algorithms. So let's say that we have one algorithm that we are developing and we want to compare it against the state of the art. And in the state of the art, there are three algorithms that are considered in the state of the art. So we have four different algorithms that we are comparing, A, B, C, and D. Can we use the t-test from previous class? So in the t-test that we studied in previous classes, we had two algorithms that we wanted to compare, A and B, right? So one way to think about it would be to do a round-robin comparison. So compare A versus B, then A versus C, then A versus D. Is that the right way to do this? Well, unfortunately, doing this sort of repeated testing would be a mistake. We could do this comparison and test A versus B and see which one is smaller and see if the difference is that is clearly significant. And then we do B and C and then we do D and then we count how many times each test showed the smallest mean. What's the problem with that? Well, remember that every time that we do a statistical test, this is a probability. There is a probability of the test itself being wrong, which is like the type one error and the type two error that we discussed about. When we repeat the same test many times, these errors, they are multiplied. So imagine that you have a test that is wrong in only 5% of the time. If you do this test two times, this probability will grow. If you do the test three times, the probability will grow even further. When you do the test four or five times, we're already looking at a test that will be wrong at maybe 20 or 30% of the time. Now our test is not so reliable anymore. So what do we do? So here's an example, right? If we do one test, uh, we got one error of zero of 5%, two tests, the, the chance of error is 9%, six tests, the chance of error is 25%, 20 tests, the chance of error is 65%. So let's think of an, a concrete example and discuss what we can do based on this concrete example. The example here is a paper manufacturing factory, right? So we want to build, uh, to, to, to uh, construct paper in our factory, and we want to choose what's the best material for the paper. So the material is measured on tensile strength. That's the result. So if we choose a good material, our paper will have a lot of tensile state, tensile strength. If we choose a bad material, the paper will have low tensile strength. We can imagine that it's reasonable to think that the tensile strength would change according to the material, and we choose four different types of materials to test this. So suppose that we have a total budget, so how many, ex how many observations we can do. So we can only take six observations for each type of, paper, of, each type of material. So what this experiment, when we describe it like this, we have one experimental factor, which is the material, the wood fiber. We have four levels, so the fiber types A, B, C, and D, and we have six replicates at each level. Okay, so we are here specifying our experiment. We have six replicates per level, we have four levels, and we have one factor, which is wood fiber. Now, the response variable is the tensile strength, that the variable, the output variable that we are observing when we change our input variable, which is the type of paper. Okay, now, we want to know if any of the materials leads to an increase in the, in the mean tensile strength of the paper. Now, uh, the, the difference that we are interested in is 5 kPa. If the difference is not at least 5 kPa, then it's not important for us. Okay, 
and uh, upper estimate for the standard deviation is 6 kPa standard deviation based on previous knowledge. The error levels for this test, we want alpha to be 0.1, so we want a 90% confidence test, and beta equals 0.2, so we want an 80% power test. So before we do any sort of tests, uh, it's always important to first examine the data. So we generate six boxes of paper for each of the materials and we measure the tensile strength of the six boxes. And we got um, um, a, a, a um, data that kind of looks like this. So here in the horizontal axis, we have the fiber type. Here in the vertical axis, we have the strength of the paper. And you can see the red, we can see the green, we can see the blue, and we can see the purple. And we can already see that there seems to be some difference based on the type of paper. Now we don't know if this difference is significant or if this difference is just uh, due to luck. So how do we do? How do we analyze that? So the box suggested a difference in among factors. Uh, we can also see a small variability in the levels. So for instance, we see that type B has a, a bigger variability, and type A has a very small variability. And we see that type C maybe has an outlier here that we might want to deal with this outlier. So how can we model this situation where we have several uh, types or several factors that we want to compare? So we're going to model this as follows. We have y, that is our output variable, and we have our input variable. And y is defined as the means, okay, and the error associated with each observation. Now this error is broken in two parts. The first part is the tau, which is the type of paper, and the second part is the error associated with the experiment. Okay? <clears throat> so the derivative of the statistical test is very similar to what we already done for the t-test. So first we try to consider what are the possible differences in tau. Okay? So let's consider that for now, in this model, let's assume that this error, the, the, the general error, uh, experiment error, is distributed following a normal distribution with independent, uh, in the internally independent variables with mean zero and variance equals to the sigma squared. Now, under this assumption, our res experiment results look something like this. We have four factors, and for each of these factors, we have a normal distribution that shows what are the passable values for these uh, for these levels of the factors of the factor. Four levels, not four factors, sorry. Four levels for one factor. And for each level, we have a possible, di possibly different uh, distribution. We want to know if these distributions are really different or if they are the same, if all of them have the same mean. So we have the grand mean and the mean for each of the levels. Okay. In this case, our new hypothesis is that all of these uh, levels, they have the same mean. They are all the same. This tall is zero for each of the factors. Our alternate hypothesis is that there is at least one of these four levels where tau is not zero and it comes from a different distribution. So here we want to know if at least one of the levels is different from all of the others. If we collect, if we collect the data in a random order using constant experimental conditions, we can do a complete, what well, is called a completely randomized design. <clears throat> so what I described here is the fixed effect models. The fixed effect models says that each of the fact, each of the levels in this factor has a fixed effect that can be zero, it can be different of zero, and there are no other factors that have a significant effect on the mean average. So I just need to worry about this one factor that I'm varying. Okay. This approach is appropriate when we test hypotheses when the factor levels are defined by the experimenter. We have everything equal except for one factor that we are changing. Okay? In this case, the inference is made over the mean values for each level and cannot be extended for similar levels that were not tested. So when we test these four types of woods, the inference that we are here, we are testing here does not apply. In the case of computer science, when we test like for four algorithms, and we say that one algorithm is better than the other three, we cannot say from this experiment that this, this one algorithm is better than all the other algorithms in the world. Our experiment is limited to these four algorithms that we tested. Okay? Other situations may require different kinds of modeling, so random or mixed effects. But we're going to maybe talk about this in a future lecture. 
So let's go back to our model. And here we use the fixed effect model to de describe the statistical test. So we have our output variable yij, we have our mean, we have our tau that changes for each level of the factor, and we have our, ge our general errors. And again, uh, our new hypothesis, um, because we have our grand mean, by this construction, we know that the sum of all the effects is zero. Like if the sum of all the tau is not zero, then this would not be the mean that we have. So when we have this, we can express the variability of the data by the total sum of the squares, which represents the sum of the deviation between each observation and the, the main mean. So each observation and the mean, we're gonna generate like this variation. And what we want to compare is the difference between the general error, so the error between the difference of the output for one level and the grand mean, and the difference between the error, the general error and the error of one level. Okay, so when we do this comparison, what we have is that we have the mean square for all the levels and the mean square for the error. And the expected value of this follow this, like this is the great mean, mean square. So the mean square for the error for the entire experiment is sigma. And the mean square for the levels would be sigma square, uh, the, the, the mean square error for the levels would be sigma squared plus this factor that is a factor specific for each level. So what's going to happen here is that under the new hypothesis, this would be zero because ti is zero for everyone. And these two effects, the error of the levels and the error of the entire experiment would be the same. When the new hypothesis is not true, we're gonna have a non-zero factor here for the level, uh, for the error of the level, and the difference between the error of one level and the error of the entire experiment will be different. So here we are comparing these two variances, the variance of one group and the variance of the entire experiment. And if they are the same, this is evidence that the new hypothesis is true, well, not true, but it cannot be rejected. And if they are different, if there's a big difference between the, uh, the square errors of one level and the square errors of the entire experiment, this is evidence that the new hypothesis should be rejected. So here we have our statistic. This is the F statistic, and the F statistic is exactly that. The difference between the mean squared of the levels, uh, the, the, sorry, the fraction between the mean square of the levels and the total mean square. If both of these are the same, then f will be one. If they are different, then f will be different. And generally, we're gonna have the mean square of the levels to be bigger than the general mean there, but we can have it small as well. So under the new hypothesis, so yeah, uh, if the new hypothesis is false, the expected value of FMS level is larger, which re 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 uh, results in high values of f. So under the new hypothesis, uh, this would follow uh, f, would follow a key square distribution, and we can use here the ANOVA to, cal to calculate uh, the value of f and compare it with the expected distribution. Okay, so here we have the calculation of the ANOVA analysis of variance on R. And we can see that we have like the fiber type, we have different five types of fiber. Uh, we can see the F value for the fiber type is like 36. And we can see that the square error for the types, the square error of the levels is much bigger than the square error of the residuals, which give us this uh, p-value of under 0 0.01 in this case. Okay, so this indicates, this p-value indicates that we reject the new hypothesis. But again, we rejected the new hypothesis. What is the new hypothesis and what are we rejecting here? So remember that the new and alternative hypothesis of ANOVA is that the new hypothesis is that the difference factor, the difference value for all the levels of the factor is zero. So all the levels have the same mean. And the alternate hypothesis is that there is at least one level that is different from all the others. So when we reject the new hypothesis here, we say we, this indicates to us that there is at least one level with an effect that is significant, uh, significantly different from zero. 
But now we have the question, which of the levels is significance differently from zero? So we need to answer these two questions, um, which level is different? And we also need to check the assumptions of the test. So first let's validate the ANOVA model. So the ANOVA model has some assumptions that are not very strong, but we need to check these assumptions to um, make sure that our results are valid. The assumptions of the ANOVA model are independence, so the observations must be independent from each other. And this is the same assumption of independence that we have been talking about in the other tests. We have this assumption that almost ethnicity, which means that equality of variances across groups. The, the, the name is difficult, but it just means that all groups have equivalent variances. And the assumption of normality for the residuals of the data. So the residuals of the model are obtained. It's we can calculate. It's just the uh, value of each observation minus the estimated mean. Okay. And when we take the normality, no, we observe the normality assumption of the residuals. We can use here a QQ plot, and we can see that it's roughly roughly follows norm. There are some uh, um, outliers in the top and the bottom, but usually uh, we can. This is not enough for uh, enough. Um, deviation from the normality to uh, there are no like huge a uh, um, outliers here that would lead us to oh we want to use a um, non-parametric test here. ANOVA is relatively robust to most definition of normality as long as the other assumptions are verified. Okay, if the sample size is not large enough or the other assumptions cannot be verified, then we should instead using a non-parametric test. There are several tests that we can use. If we want unpaired non-parametric test for multiple samples, we want the Kraska-Wallis test. If we want a paired non-parametric test for multiple samples, we want the Friedman test. So check these two kinds of tests for non-parametric comparison across multiple samples. Now let's look about the equality of variance, similarity of variances. So one way to test this is to plot the residuals on this sort of like parallel plots. So here are the residuals for the four types of wood. And we can see that the variances are roughly of around the same level. Okay. But we can also use the Fligner test to test the uh, validity. And we can see that here, the Fligner test does not reject the new hypothesis that the four uh, variances are similar. Of course, uh, ANOVA is also robust to small vari variations of these uh, similar var variance condition as long as the sample is balanced, which means as long as all the samples have about the same number of observations. Finally, the independence assumption that the dependence assumption should be guaranteed on the design phase. Now, the ANOVA is very sensitive to violations of independence. Um, so make sure to do randomization of other factors and attention to possible sources of noises to guarantee the independence assumptions when you're doing ANOVA. Okay, now once we guaranteed that the assumptions of the ANOVA are held, we still need to test which one of the um, method, which one of the paper types uh, has the smallest mean. Um, and there are several ways to do this, depending on the objective of the experiment. So we can do a comparison of all against all using the, um, the um, how to say, the confidence interval. Uh, we can do a comparison of one method against the others, if we're doing a test of like the proposed method against the other ones. Um, the important thing though is that how we're going to compare, if we're going to compare all against all, or one method against the others, or the lowest method against the others, or the highest method against the others. This must be defined before we do the experiment. If we define which comparison we want to do after we already have done the experiment, this is called harking, which is writing the hypothesis after the results are known. And this is, uh, this is a kind of um, academic, um, how do you say, cheating to use a simple word. It's like uh, some sort of like academic falsification of results. Okay, these insert biases into the analysis. If you look, oh, maybe we should compare the lowest or maybe we should compare the highest. If you do that after you look at the results, then um, you're going to introduce biases in your analysis. 
So how, what, what exactly do we want to ask ourselves when we think about the post hoc comparison? Um, in general, we want to try to do the smallest number of comparisons needed. So some type of comparisons like how one level compared to the others, or how each level compares to the grand mean, or how do the levels compare to all the others. others so. One way to do that is to do multiple comparisons. So after we do the ANOVA and we see that, okay, in fact, there is one or that levels that is different than the others, then we can do multiple comparisons based on like one versus all or one versus, or one versus each of them or all versus all. When we do that, we can uh, increase the confidence by the number of repetitions, okay? So to reduce the, the chance of type one error, we can do a compensation. So we can do multiple comparisons, multiple t-test comparisons, by using an adjusted alpha value. One simple way to adjust the alpha value is to use the Bonferroni method. The Bonferroni method says that we can adjust the alpha by getting the alpha, the general alpha that we wanted, divided by the number of comparisons that we we're making. So if we're doing four comparisons, so we get like the highest value of the highest of the uh, paper material types and we compare against the other three, then we would do our two by two comparisons using a uh, alpha of 0 0.1 divided by 4, so 0 0.0125. Uh, another way is the CDAC correction, and the CDAC correction has a somewhat a little bit more complex um, formulation. So here there is like, you can also see Schaffer's 995 for a more, um, a more detailed discussion about how to correct for alpha. Anyway, the important thing to remember, as I said, is to think about what kind of comparisons you're going to do after the ANOVA before you do the uh, data collection, okay? Because this will have an influence on how much observations you collect and the sample size calculations that we're going to talk about in the next class. There are formulas for this uh, that you can look for, um, and I'm gonna give you some readings later. Um, so I'm going to add some readings about this um, in the class, uh, in the Manabo material later. Well, this is what I wanted to talk about today regarding multiple comparisons. So I hope you enjoyed the class and I see you uh, next week. Bye-bye.